Good morning. My name is Chris Yemman. I'm leader of Whitefriars Church and also responsible for The Well, our missional community. But also I'm a husband to Liz, a father, a son of course. We all have so many hats to wear, so many intertwined relationships. Well, we've nearly reached the end of our series on mission-shaped living and we've interspersed our teaching there with some stories of hope and uh, to remind ourselves of the hope that we share as followers of Jesus. Today we have another familiar story of hope. In fact, it's the third in a series of three short stories recorded in Luke's Gospel. There are three stories of things that are lost and found. And when they're found, there's much rejoicing. The first two stories, the lost sheep, uh, which Glenda spoke on so powerfully the other week, and the lost coin, um, are all about um, sinners who have to repent. Sinners like you and me, we're all sinners. And uh, we're then found by God. And by implication, this third story has the same meaning behind it. But Jesus goes further as he speaks about the son who is not just lost and then found, but dead and restored to life. And that tells us the hope that we have in these stories is resurrection hope, new life in Christ. So today we've got the story of the lost son who willfully, intentionally turns his back on the father. In fact, worse than this, by demanding his share of the inheritance, the younger son is really saying to the father, I wish you were dead. And we have the image of the father who's waiting patiently, scanning the horizon, trying to see if his son has turned and come back. The wayward son who left him with nothing. So I ask for today, who do we identify in this story? Where is hope to be found and what is the source of that hope? Perhaps we identify with the younger son. Perhaps we've had times in our lives when we've turned our backs on God, gone our own way, intentionally made life choices which we knew were not part of God's plan for our lives. We've been wayward children, thinking we know better than our Heavenly Father about how our lives should be led, seeking our own pleasure first. Maybe that's the place we're in now far away from the love of God. Maybe we're in that place of brokenness, described in the three circles model that Josh outlined last week, trying to do all sorts of things to escape inappropriate relationships, endless shopping or consuming, excesses of all sorts, yet each attempt to leave our brokenness on, on our own is doomed to failure and we're just snapped back like a bungee cord. Well, if that's you, then hear this good news. This is the hope for you. Your loving Heavenly Father is waiting for you, scanning the horizon, hoping you will turn back. That's all you need to do. That's the meaning of the word repent. Turn back. Go the other way. It's a change of heart and mind. It said in verses 20 and 21. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Did you notice that the younger son didn't even get to the end of his pre-prepared speech? He... Uh, his father interrupts him and welcomes him back, dresses him up in fine clothes and uh, celebrates by having a party. The gift of receiving new life in Christ is always a cause of celebration and joy. The younger son was welcomed home with joy. He had just to turn to the father to be lifted out of his brokenness and restored to the father's love. But maybe you're like the father, praying for your own prodigals. Maybe there are those in your life, family, friends, your own children even, who have gone their own way. 
You long for them to turn back and rediscover their love of God. Maybe you brought them up in faith, took them to church, nurtured them in the faith. And now they've decided not to make God central to their lives anymore. And it hurts. It's painful. It feels like a rejection of all that you hold dear. Well, if that's you, hear this. God feels your pain with you. In the story, the, the younger son didn't just leave the father. He slammed the door in his face. Yet we learn that the father's response is not anger or sullenness, but love and compassion. And that's what our response should be too. Love our prodigals. Pray for our prodigals. Show them compassion whenever possible. And this is our story. Liz and I brought up our boys as part of the church family and longed them to remain in a close, deep relationship with God. But one by one they stepped back. They chose their own path. Our youngest, Josh, stayed close for the longest, but even he returned from university, a well thought through atheist. He claimed there is no God. So we continued to pray for them. Now, most of you know that tragically our son Josh died of Covid in March this year. Of course, we were devastated. But deep down in my heart, my greatest fear was about his salvation. Had I prayed enough? Had I been a faithful witness enough? Had my failings led him away from trusting in his heavenly father? Well, I want you to know the hope that we have. As Jeff defined it when he lit the Advent candle the other week, hope is when you look forward to something but expect it to happen. Liz and I were given some amazing assurances in the weeks just after Josh died. Uh, they were from family, from friends, from people close and people far away. And we were assured that Josh is safe with Jesus, in Jesus' arms, in heaven. Jesus told us, I've got him. And my brother, he was reflecting on this very scripture, the prodigal son. He heard Josh say, I'm fine. And Jesus confirm, he's fine. So we must continue to pray for our prodigals, as someone did of Josh on the day he died, that he would have a powerful encounter with his protector and sustainer. Now, this has been pretty challenging for my faith, my understanding of salvation. I know that we need to repent and turn to Christ to be saved. But I don't know whether Josh did that as a, a child or a youngster growing up in church or at one of the events or... Uh, Christian festivals we went to together, whether at the point of death he turned to Christ, or whether facing God at the judgment seat, he was able to accept Christ as his Lord. We know, don't we, that uh, one of the criminals crucified on the cross beside Jesus was accepted into paradise that very moment of his death. All I know is the sure and certain hope that Josh is safe with God in heaven. The picture of assurance that I was given was of um, a father carrying his son through the wilderness to the promised land. A couple of days after Josh died, uh, I was reading a daily devotion from a few weeks back, actually. It was from Deuteronomy chapter 1, after the Israelites had been freed from slavery in Egypt but before they'd reached the promised land, it said this. The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. It also reminded me of the famous poem, Footprints in the Sand, 
Perhaps that was even based on this verse, I don't know. It tells of the complaints of someone who looked back at his life as a trek on the beach with God. Most of the time there were two sets of footprints, but at the hardest times in his life, he saw only one set of footprints. It concludes, my precious, precious child, I love you and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you, your Heavenly Father. There's a sense in which we carry our prodigals with love and care in prayer through the wilderness to the very edge of the promised land. Then we must simply entrust them to the care of our Heavenly Father. And quickly and finally, the, uh, the, the, there's a sense um, that maybe you're like the older brother. Quite frankly, you're, you're annoyed with the younger son. You've remained faithful to God, serving him throughout your life. You don't, didn't wander off and do your own thing. Maybe there's even a sense of jealousy that you didn't enjoy those fleeting pre- pleasures that the younger son uh, brought in his wayward life. If that's you then hear this. Your Heavenly Father loves you deeply and has never stopped loving you. He tells you that you're promised an inheritance that will neither rust nor fade. Eternal life with him in heaven. As Peter puts it in one of his letters in the Bible. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. In your relationship with God, you have the light and power of the Holy Spirit poured into your life, and the promise of all the riches of heaven when you die. What could be better than that? And as at the end of all these three stories, there is a celebration, a feast, a heavenly banquet. Let's enjoy it. The more the merrier. Let's celebrate when another is invited. Hear the words of your heavenly father. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So in every case, whether we are lost and need to repent and turn to the Father, whether we long for our prodigals to return to their Father's love, whether we're faithfully serving the Father but need to join in with the celebration of new life in Christ, we know that the source of the hope which we share is found in the love and goodness of God, our Heavenly Father. We're going to listen to a song about that now. 